Hello, and welcome back to Suzerain, the Kingdom of Rhesia, with Robus Taurus. In today's video, we continue on after, well, <sighs> risking it all on pa with Pales. Aeon disputes us. We won't stand for it. We won't stand for it. Late night at the palace. Palace Rizna. I was woken up in the middle of the night by the Golden Guard. Due to the sensitivity of the information, I had to be urgently briefed in perfect person. As the king, I knew such a summons could only mean dire news. I put on my clothes and followed Titus through the corridors of the palace. Do you know what this is about? I was told to come to get you, your majesty. I, be I believe there's an important situation that needs your immediate attention. We arrived at the doors of the council chambers. Hugo and Vina greeted me. Apologies for disturbing both of you at this hour. Thank you for being here so quickly. Of course, uncle. He tugged at my arm, leaned in, and whispered, Ramus, my boy, I'm afraid we'll be facing our biggest crisis. Yes, I must stress. This is the time everybody needs a calm and resilient leadership. He took a long look at me and my clothes that I'd rushed to put on. Your butler couldn't be summoned in time, I take it. He put his hand on my shoulder. Make sure you're ready. I'm sure you'll do the right thing. You're not making this any easier. I need to know what happened right now. You are right. Let's just go in. He opened the doors for us, and we entered a scene of barely restrained chaos. The counselors were already gathered inside, their faces etched with lines of worry. Upon my interest, they all stood up immediately. Lucita approached me with a calm demeanor that contrasted with the anxiety atmosphere inside. She bowed and spoke. Your Majesty, we have an emergency report. About an hour ago, we received grave mo moves, to put it lightly or mildly. A very serious incident at sea around the Aurelius gas field has unfolded. May the divine god protect us all. I wish there was another way to put it, this. The Grand Duchy of Pales has committed an act of war. Ugh. That sounds serious. Let's just calm down and start from the beginning. This is what we know so far. Approximately half an hour ago, the ships we sent to enforce our claim to the Aurelius gas field fired on and sunk a Polisian vessel. According to our reports, a small fleet of three Polisian ships advanced directly at our ships despite repeated warnings. The vessel that was sunk was not only warned, it managed to ram into our flagship, the RN Velro, damaging it almost beyond repair. Our fleet then acted in retaliation, discharging its weapons at the Polisian and sinking one of their ships. Their other two vessels were immediately surrounded. They are still being kept at the location of the incident. It's an outrage! They were warned, yet they encroached upon the field, knowing that our navy would defend it. That's true. Our fleet only acted in defense of our nation's asset, but this is still a disaster. This sinking of the ship is grave matter. And the casualties? We're still asserting the full extent, but primarily reports suggest multiple injuries aboard Vero. And theirs? We don't know yet, your majesty. May Stank Warwick embrace their souls. You go side heavily. And the extent of the damage? Severe, your majesty. The impact comprised the hull's integrity, causing significant flooding in the engine room and adjacent compartments. The Verlo Pumpulsen system is heavily damaged. We're doing the ship immobile. It is currently running on emergency power, but the flooding is critical. The damage control streams are working tirelessly, but without external assistance, the risk of losing the flagship is very high. We estimate approximately 150 sailors are engaged in containment efforts as we speak. And the Palaisian ship? It's the same catastrophic damage post-collision. Seconds after the collision, it was shot at multiple shots by our frigates. It capsized minutes after the ramming. However, there are, there are reasons to believe that collision was enough for it to sink, and our shots may not be the main reason. It is too easy to tell. Our initial reports indicate survivors, but they are in perilous waters, your majesty. We simply can't let them drown. We have to do something. We need our efforts to focus on saving the Vero and the sailors inside. How did the engagement come to pass? According to the report, around 0400 hours, our navy forces consisting of the flagship RRN, RRN Velero and three frigates were patrolling the field when the Legion fleet composed of three armed vessels approached the disputed zone. Despite repeated warnings, they continued their advance, executing aggressive maneuvers. The vessel that in indicated the conflict attempted to bypass our blockade, accelerating towards RRN 
Velero, in a reckless act, it rammed our flagship on the starboard side, near the engine room. <clears throat> And the remaining Polynesian vessels? The remaining two, upon seeing their companion's fate, ceased their advance and currently hold at a standoff distance. They're completely surrounded and outgunned. The Admiral is waiting for your orders on how to deal with the situation. Additionally, it is reported that there are survivors from the gliding ship. These are perilous waters, Your Majesty, so we do not know if you will be able to manage a complete rescue operation without any help arriving. Our fleet is currently fully focusing on holding the remaining vessels in place, while trying to help the RN Burrow contain the flooding. What is the distance to the nearest Riesian port for additional support? The closest port capable of dispatching resource rescue team is on the mainland. Under current conditions, it would take several hours for a rescue team to reach the site. Those solars don't have several hours in those waters, Your Grace. We're talking about the open sea. They're likely without sufficient life-saving equipment. Your Majesty, leaving the Polynesian sailors to fend for themselves could be seen as severe derogation of maritime duty. It would damage our international standings, and the Duke would paint us as humane. This is their game, Councilor Escobar. We can't let them write the rules for it. However, focusing our efforts on the R in Velero is crucial. It's not only about saving our flagship, which is our most expensive asset in the Navy, but also about preventing further loss of Riesian life. Diverting our frigates to rescue could jeopardize the containment efforts of the Velero, as well as risk the escape of the Polynesian vessels. Vino, what do you think? We should defer our efforts to rescue those sailors. Our priority should be human lives, regardless of if it's Polynesian or Riesian. And if it was indeed their plan to push in us into this corner, we shouldn't fall for their trap. We should show the world that Riesian has compassion even when attacked. Wise words, your highness. I think I have the picture. Any last thoughts before I announce my decision? May the divine grant you strength, your majesty. House Taurus expects you to use this opportunity, your majesty. Oh, we have a lot of options. We will not attempt any rescue efforts for the sailors. Fix all our rescue efforts on our, our end. Well, we'll dispatch a rescue team for the mainland for the bag ship. We'll make sure our frigates are locked into the thing. Our first duty is to our own. Focus all efforts on the RN. We'll dispatch a rescue team for the mainland that our new priorities and we'll keep the frigates focused on the mainland. Let's attempt to for frigates to aid. The surrounding Polynesian ships and the ship which uses their sailor. Yeah. We're gonna do that. I don't like it. Release the surrounded Polynesian ships and instruct them to assist their sailors. Our frigates will focus on Varello. Understood, Your Majesty. I will let the Admiral know your orders immediately. It's a risky maneuver, Your Majesty. I hope this does not come at the loss cost of losing all of our leverage. Releasing the, their ships is regrettable, but it may be the best course to mitigate broader consequences. I support the decision. This could foster goodwill despite the complexities. I don't care about fostering goodwill with pales. I care about fostering goodwill with the international community. We can't have them spinning, like creating a spinning story where they paint us as the evildoers here. We have to play the victim. <laughs> Look, we've got to try to... We don't want them to spin the story. We need to spin the story. We need to spin it where we're the victims, not them. They attacked us, and we did our best to try to help as much as we could, protect our own men and theirs. And yet they are such... They decided to do all this horrible stuff. Maybe they'll even, like, attack us afterwards, and then we'll be able to really play the victim. That would be fun. I'm hoping to play the victim here. <laughs> you know? Hey, you gotta have a plan. I agree with her... I agree with Her Highness, Your Majesty. Our house and Riesian nationals would have expected us to use this opportunity, though. I can, I can only hope this doesn't turn into a larger problem. I believe your majesty has already made his decision. The counselors fell silent. Was there anything else? I believe that was all, your majesty. The counselors bowed in respect and left the room. Woo! Ah, oh, yeah, we got our... We got some more min in production, so that's gone down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Low military equipment stockpile. I've read that like three times. King Ramus traveling to Pales. Following the blatant Polynesian attack on Riesian assets, King Ramus has decided to travel to Pales, showing Riesian commitment to international diplomacy. There he is expected to sternly talk to Grand Duke, making clear Riesian's disapproval with Polynesian actions. However, should Pales refuse to listen to Riesian's concerns and not take up the King's generous offer of peace, Riesian's military stands ready to respond to attacks against our country. 
Bells attacks Rezian gas field. The Pelesian vessels attempted to break Rezia's rightful blockade of the Aurelius gas field, located largely within Rezian maritime borders, with one of them paying the heaviest price. The blatant attack was targeted at the pride of the Rezian Royal Navy, the RN Borough, which was heavily damaged by the ramming attempt. We, th we thank our mighty fleet for swiftly responding, sinking the offending Pelesian ship, and will pray for a rapid recovery of these injured aboard the Borough. Pales will pay for the act of aggression. Major escalation at Rezia sinks Pelesian ship. In the early morning, the Pelesian Navy attempted to break the naval blockade of Rezia as opposed to Aurelius Gasfield, a disputed part of the Atean Sea that has seen ever-increasing diplomatic and military maneuvering between Rezia and Pales in recent months. The result was deadly, as one of the Pelesian ships rammed the Rezian RRN Varel, resulting in formidable damage to the flagship. The Rezia's remaining ships opened fire, sinking one of the Pelesian vessels and surrounding the Rain too. The exact number of casualties is currently still unknown. Major Scott and Rokopa called for strength to avoid a further escalation of the conflict, but any international observers are afraid all out war is on the horizon it most certainly could be thousands marched to demand repercussions for sailors death hundreds of thousands of people have gathered across the Pelagian cities demanding the international community to take action against what is perceived as a Rezian war crime the sinking of the Pelagian vessel by Rezian ships and the subsequent failure to rescue all the sailors abroad said ship has sparked outrage across all levels of Pelagian society come on you suck I did my best. I literally did my best to keep as many people of mine and theirs safe, okay? We can't play the victim, but we're at least being a humanitarian good person, you dummies. We could have used our taken advantage, done some other things, you know, made things work for us, but instead we tried to be good people, okay? Okay? <sighs> people never understand. People don't understand me. Meeting with Duke Reinhardt about the incident. This, uh, I think there's about a 50% chance we're at war with, with Pales by the end of this episode. But let's wait and see. Our convoy drove steadily across the cobbled streets of Old Town Pales. It was my second vision to the Belizean capital since becoming King of Rezia, and the atmosphere this time was far more tense. The specter of the recent naval incident cast a long shadow over our relations. I sensed it in the mood of everyone around me. Upon our arrival to Castle Reinhardt, we were greeted by the expressionless faces of the Pelesian delegates, with no sign of the Duke himself. No pleasantries were exchanged, and no diplomatic gestures were played to the cameras. We were instead quickly ushered inside as the reporters were blocked off. Nobody from my concerty detail, nor the welcoming delegation, spoke as we entered the room where the meeting was to take place. When Duke Reinhardt entered the room, everyone else left. He didn't speak a word until we were completely alone. King Ramis, your rushed arrival here is a testament to the gravity of our situation. I wish I could say your visit today brings me comfort, but under these circumstances I find it hard to extend a warm welcome. Duke Reinhardt. He extended his hand for a handshake. I sh shook his hand and we both sat down. He stared at me, brow furrowed. Look, I do not intend to allow Pales to be pushed around by Reezy any longer, so please listen to me very carefully. I listened to his words. Despite the AN ruling against you, you insisted on maintaining your blockade on the field, in direct violation of the resolution. What right does the Rezian Navy have to block our access to the field? You not only went against international law, you sank a Pelesian ship. Is this not a declaration of war? What dialogue could you possibly be after? Please help me understand, your majesty, because I'm having a devil of a time making sense of your actions right now. Let's let's get our facts straight, Your Grace. Your ship was warned, but they not only ignored them, our flagship was rammed into. We are not the side who fired at you. Yeah, you're not the side that fired at us. You're the side that rammed into us. That's semantics. You're using semantics. Ramming into me is pretty much the equivalent of firing a gun at me. Like, if someone knocks, like, like if it was an actual person being shot at or being ran into, knocked out, and stabbed almost to death is about as, is, I guess, slightly not as bad as being shot to death, but they're pretty similar situations, sir. Like, one is me being stabbed to the verge of death, the other is being shot to death. It's like, you stabbed me to almost death first, so I shot you to death. That's probably, you know... Actually, it's more like you stabbed me to almost death, then my friend behind me was like, Ah! He's trying to kill us! And then shot you to death. Like, that's kind of, like, you know, he was kind of probably worried he was going to get stabbed to almost death as well. 
or that you are about to stab me to actual death in just a moment. You know? We are not the side who fired at you. Reezy is directly responsible for sinking our ship. So tell me, Your Majesty, what is the stance of your kingdom? What are you trying to achieve here? It's true, it was my decision to blockade the sheep field, but the incident wouldn't have happened if your ship didn't ram into us. The damage it inflicted was extensive. Are you not going to accept any responsibility? Is this Reezy's official stance, then? We will not accept responsibility for retaliating for your attack against our flagship. Pales is the one that escalated the incident. And I have nothing else to say to this, except this. Are you going to listen to our concerns or not? I'm listening for now. He straightens his back. First of all, you must pay reparation for the ship you sank and suffering and the chaos brought. Needless to say, your navy will never be deployed in the release again. To ensure that you will sign an official concession and join the AN and purchase results and pales full ownership of the gas fields. Absolutely not. He paused for a moment, his face darkened. I see. Then you won't be surprised to hear that Pelagian Navy is deployed in the Aurelius. It will not bow down against your aggression any longer. Reezy will not have no access whatsoever to any energy from our TNC. I will let the world know about your stance. Let's see who they'll support. You seem confident despite Reezy's clear breach of international law. If you really think anyone will support Reezy, you are living in a land of fantasy, your majesty. If you try to block our access, we will take it by force. This would be a cause for war. As I already said, it's not a matter of if anymore. Our navy should be arriving as we speak. Pales is ready to defend what is ours. Then war it is, your grace. A sudden spasm of fear took hold on his face. I see. You are making the same mistake as your father, it seems. You will be responsible for all the lives that will be lost. He quickly looked up and gestured at the door. You are no longer welcome here. We won't meet again. The security quickly ushered me outside. I walked through the hall with quick steps, images of war and horror appearing in my head. One or two was waiting for me outside the with a concerned look on his face. I tried to tell him about what ha happened with as few words as possible. Well, we're going to war. Situation updated. State of war. State of war with the Grand Duchy of Pales. The declaration of war against the Grand Duchy of Pales propels the nation to heightened state of military engagement and diplomatic isolation. This conflict shifts the regional pal power balance, necessitates strategic realignments and robust military posturing. The war front demands a complex interplay of tactical and military operations and diplomatic efforts to navigate the evolving international landscape and safeguard national interests. Adequately trained in officer corps. Reezy takes pride in officer corps, a group of well-schooled military minds molded by rigorous training programs. Their extensive often off offset some of the logistical challenges faced by the armed forces during competent command during critical operations. Pelagian War Department. The southern border with Pales witnesses a considerable military presence due to war. While the deployment of the force is critical for the war officer, it also strains Reezy's international internal defense capabilities, leaving other frontiers pot potentially vulnerable. Uh, we also are now um, losing money because of war expenditures, but, you know, that's fine. The local resistance to Pales against Reezian forces is currently minimal, indicating a low level of opposition among the Pelagian populace. The weak resistance suggests a limited support for the moment and the presence of relatively minor obstacles to Reezia's military operations in the area. The situation offers opportunity for Reezia to advance his objectives with reduced local pushback. That's good for the moment. Rezia benefits from superpower trade war. The hubris of both superpowers, which have culminated in the trade war between the two, is benefiting the Rezian treasury thanks to shrewd management by King Ramis. To King Ramis. And energy prices soar, Rezia's domestic supply ensures low prices at home, while the income from energy exports is soaring. Reminds us of the Rumbergian saying, when two dogs fight for a bone, the third runs away with it. 
Yeah, we might need to start selling energy. That is true. Fails refuses to see reason. Despite the best efforts of King Ramus to secure a last-minute agreement between Pales and Rezia, following the military incident, and appeared that the Pelesian Duke is unable to come to his senses. Our king has reportedly boarded a plane back to Rezia as the armed forces are placed in high alert. A further escalation of the conflict now seems unavoidable. Glory to the troops, Pales and Rezia at war. As the first reports are of fighting on the Pelesian border started coming in last night, one thing has become clear. Rezia and Pales are at war once again. While the palace hasn't commented yet on these early reports, King Ramus has announced he will give a speech later today. For now, the Royal Herald declares its commitment to our brave troops and prays for victory on the battlefield. Glorious Axis Rezia. Rezian King leaves Pales in hurry as talks break down. Last effort talks to avoid conflict between Rezian and Pales hosted in the latter's capital seem to have broken down as King Ramus left the country in a hurry. Neither side has issued statements, but insiders reported the mood within the Pelagian government appears grim, with many expecting war to break out. The international community is once again called for restraint. Both these calls appear to appear hollow after having been repeated so many times before. Fighting erupts as Rezia seemingly invades Pales. Last night, first reports started emerging of Pelesian border posts being shelled by Rezian troops, as well as vital agents of Pelesian airspace and the first tank comms entering border areas. While the full scale of the in incident is not yet clear, everything indicates a full-scale invasion. King Ramus is expected to formally declare the state started the war in a speech scheduled for this afternoon. Already, CSP and ATO representatives have condemned the aggression, calling for an immediate retreat of Rezian troops and restart negotiations. The Alignment of the Six Stars The Portage's on the authorization tower stood tall against the night sky, stars twinkling overhead as my motorcade arrived beneath it. However, it has now functioning, functioned more as a museum than an astronomical observation due to the city's light pollution. It served as a tangible relic of Reese's bygone era, when celestial wonders were more easily unveiled. I'd come to meet with Grand Wiseman Ignatius for the alignment of six stars, a, where, a rare worstistic celestial event that occurred every 200 years. I've been looking forward to this extraordinary occasion for quite some time, eager to see what the stars would reveal. I hear the alignment is going to be quite the sight, especially from that vantage point. Titus nodded towards the top of the tower. I'm sure the view will be awe-inspiring, a testament to the grand designs of a creator. Divis Lores Dirari. Was Dorisus for God be praised. Before long, Titus and I vacated our vehicle, went inside, and began ascending the spiraling staircase. By the time I was halfway up, I was beginning to regret that an elevator hadn't been installed. Titus, on the other hand, barely broke a sweat. I really need to get on whatever reg workout regiment you're on. It would be my honor. Just let me know when, and I'll make it happen. We were met by two guards standing alongside a wooden door, who, one of whom opened it for us. I stepped inside while Titus remained behind. The room, a sanctuary of ancient knowledge, was dimly lit. The air carried the scent of aged books and burning incense. The candles cast a soft glow around the room. Sal, who was hunched over an altar, adorned with celestial charts and religious artifacts, appeared deeply engrossed in preparations for the celestial event, seemingly unaware of my presence. I hope I'm not interrupting anything. Startled, he raises his head to meet my gaze. Forgive my oversight, your majesty. I didn't realize you had entered. I've been immersed in arrangements for tonight's momentous occasion. Think nothing of it. The wise man's face brightened. I'm delighted to have you here. Prepare yourself for an event that promises to be truly exhilarating. It's quite remarkable that we're about to witness the same celestial alignment Saint Warwick behold so many years ago. We've equated with the story, aren't you? That I am. It symbolizes the timeless connection between our faith and the heavens. Indeed it does. If it pleases you, I'd be honored to retell the story as we celebrate tonight's events. 
I've heard it before, but a retelling would be welcome. Splendid. <clears throat> and began to pace around the room. In the tenets of Warricism, there unfolds a celestial saga of the alignment of six stars. Imagine Saint Warwick, our venerable faith architect, embracing, embarking on a sacred sojourn into this cosmic vastness. Guided by the divine insight, Saint Warwick witnessed the cosmic ballad, grasping the profound significance of the alignment. With spiritual brilliance, he condensed the eleven pillars into six, aligning with the celestial bodies now recognized as planets. Exactly the way I remember it. I'm pleased to hear it. Continuing on, Saint Warwick perceived the alignment as a symbol of spiritual evolution, a journey towards a more harmonious interconnectedness in the cosmic and spiritual realms. Each aligned planet embodying a pillar became a torch illuminating simplified teachings and testament to diverse perspectives within Warricism. The alignment of the six stars acts as a celestial guide, directing the faithful in the journey to enlightenment. And that's what we're here to bear witness to tonight. Thank you, Sal. Your oratory skills would be make Saint Work proud. Sal nodded appreciatively. If you'll follow me, we can continue our discussion on the balcony, where we may witness the magnificent of the event unfold before us. As requested, I stepped into the cool evening air alongside him. I took in the sight of Portage's on, sprawling, sprawled beneath. Its lights flickered like stars in the night. However, when I turned my gaze upwards, there were no stars to be seen. Instead, nothing but clouds blanketed the sky above. It appears the heavens have other plans in mind. Let's be patient. Our interventions may unfold in due time. The cosmos has a language of its own. Tonight it speaks of destiny and the intertwining of fates. And I do hope its message illuminates our religious journey. Speaking of which, how do pe the people of Rizi interpret the cosmic language? It holds a unique place in their hearts, and is as diverse as the stars above. As for their overall prevailing sentiments, it pains me to say it, but you've fallen out of favor with Warsis community. It began when funding the restoration of the Arch Sanctuary of Plavo as it was denied. It was viewed as a slap in the face to supporting much needed Warsis initiatives. However, the state's welfare program has been seen as a favorable initiative. Thus, Nurse and Gulkness communities see it as that way as well. That pleases me to hear. What of the Nurse community? As a community predominantly composed of Wessex and Rumburgians, their perspective is that your lack, the, your lack of acceptance for diversity has diminished respect among them. Withholding financial support for Destiner's Grand Sanctuary of Celibus has notably diminished your majesty's likability within their community. Their perceive is not just as physical, but also as a symbolic representation of decline, neglect of the religious heritage within our kingdom. Our sanctuary's side, overall their expressed dissatisfaction, preservation of their well-being as a minority religion. While their discontent is acknowledged, the fate of the Archdiocese was a strategic decision, a necessary compromise for the greater stability of our kingdom. Certainly, Your Majesty. But I also urge caution. The community is already in a delicate state, and any misstep could heighten tensions. Now, as for the Galkinist community, the listening of the blasphemy law has strengthened their relations. Their decision to allow the crossing Morella and the port. Point Darte Porter Crossing was seen favorably, as did your willingness to not extradite the pilgrims from Archdiocese Plavo. In addition, your choice to refrain from imposing restrictions on Dirty and Gulkinist in their territories played a significant role in making the stability of the community. It goes without saying that it would have been surely added to their list of grievances had it been implemented. Their community's well-being is under a careful stewardship of the crown, which is a path of benevolence, allowing their stability to flourish. And I advise that we keep it that way. We're easy to face enough problems as it is. Overall, while we're not on the Gilkness bad times, we're not on their good sides either, which pretty much covers my present assessment of the religious conditions in Rizia. 
Yeah, we've made two of our groups angry, including the main one, and made the smallest group happier, but still not that happy. Things are going great. <laughs> Your Majesty, if I may speak candidly, I've noticed shifts during your reign, particularly in matters related to the role of religion. I believe you have the kingdom's best interests at heart. I'm apprehensive that these changes might invertedly erode the sanctity and devotion traditionally linked with one true faith. Same goes with the rejection of Wellen's bluish and dirty in the land. It just feels like the priorities aren't as aligned with our sick roots as they should be. Because of this, I urge a closer examination of potential consequences, ensuring that our cherished traditions remain as the forefront of collective purpose. My chief concern is that my subjects continue to believe in the solidarity of our realm, with our income divine authority or earthly principles, their steadfast loyalty is our kingdom's strength. Are you suggesting that we alter the established religious order, one that has stood in change for centuries? It's unity I seek above all else, and if religion in any in any manifestation can achieve that, I will wholeheartedly welcome it. Well, it goes without saying that I'm partial to Rezia as a worse estate, but I will concede that there is more than one approach that could be considered. Oh, don't play coy, just tell me what you think. It goes without saying that I maintain the status quo of, by keeping Rezia united under the principles of worsism. Anything short of it would be a mistake, jeopardizing our shared values. Tell me what a governance that accommodates nerdy as a whole would look like. Personal feelings aside, the key element of taking Barak's approach lies in establishing a framework that reflects diversity while maintaining common ground for governance. This case specifically rooted in both Orcism and death nerdy, like a singular religious influence which might inadvertently exclude abortion populace and risk fostering resentment and alignment among those who don't adhere to the chosen faith. My late wife hailed from Rumberg, and prior to a conversion to Worcism, she was raised in just Nurstie's faith. Had Rizzi implemented a pluralistic system when we were married, she wouldn't have had to compromise her ideals. My mind flashed back to the revelation I'd heard about my mother's faith. And she wasn't the only one. There are others who walk the palace and practice just Nurstie. Yes, I see no reason to make such drastic concession for a minority. Yet, I still don't see no reason to make such a drastic concession for our minority religion. Morrisism has provided a stable foundation for our kingdom for the generations that have come before us. I see no reason to deviate from that path. Introducing multiple faiths risks diluting the principles that have anchored us for generations. Unity can still be achieved without compromising the strengths derived from singular religious influence. As I reflect on our kingdom's trajectory, I can't help but notice the ever-present tension between tradition and progress. Maintaining unity within our kingdom is paramount. Without it, the omniscious risk of deepening divisions may rend us asunder. A noble pursuit, your majesty. However, I would encourage you to not take a course of action. How it undermines the core principle of worrisism. I continued overlooking the city as echoes of Cell's council reverberated in my mind. I knew my any path I chose regarding Reese's religious future carried the risk of creating a backlash, if I chose to change anything at all, that is. This question assumed my thoughts, the heavens seemed to respond. The thick clouds that veiled the sky suddenly dispersed, revealing the celestial alignment of the six stars. The planet shone in a perfect harmony, a breathtaking sight that transcended it the ordinary. Below the city hushed the onlookers, collectively bore with the, witness to the extraordinary phenomenon. Sal looked, uh, seemed utterly captivated by the celestial display as well. My god, it's even more breathtaking than I could have ever imagined. A divine spectacle indeed. But Sal was too enthralled with the spectacle to hear me. 
It's as if the alignment was a cosmic reflection of choices, with each planet representing an option, celestial guidance for ruling a diverse kingdom. It was then I was reminded the visions of Sal foretold of during the creation of the king's ceremony. Fractured crowns, soldiers in war with lovers, swarms of birds and three-headed monsters. Much like your visions of the catacomb, the alignment speaks to me too. Sal looks at, looked at me, his eyes appearing to convey a shared understanding. You have shown that you are a true believer. Tell me, your majesty, do you wish for worses and play an even larger role in the kingdom's governance? Oh, I could do... Th oh, that would be a... Let's see what he says if I say this. My faith tells me that the only viable path forward is to establish a holy kingdom, previously governed by the annealing doctrine of Wurricism. At least that's why faith tells me. Saul's face gleamed with a radiance surpassing that of the stars above. I couldn't agree more. Upholding the teachings of Wurricism is a sure path to flourishing our realm. Saul leaned in with fervent glint in eyes. Your majesty, your power is guiding light that can illuminate the path to righteousness. My ensuing, ensuring decrees and government mandate align with the principles of Warricism. You could assure that the teachings pre premiate every corner of our kingdom. It would be an honor for me to accompany you on this journey towards enlightenment. I'm still not 100% certain this is the plan I wish to pursue, but I won't close off the possibility. Excellent, your majesty. A wise king never closes his mind to the vine. Is if this is ultimately becomes the policy of your choosing, I believe it's crucial to have a trusted advisor by your side, someone who has devoted every moment of his life to studying and comprehending the nuance of the worstism. I think I'm gonna go for another playthrough that's a lot like on my own time. There's a lot more towards specifically going for super absolute and super religion and not focusing because I want to because I focused a bit on military because I expected to do this pales of war probably. Um, in another one, I'll go full for this and do all the expansion stuff diplomatically and not worry about or or just be peaceful with tales and not worry about that at all and not do anything with my military that'll be when i do on my own time 100 percent because i feel like i'm spent way too much on military to be able to do some of this other things that i've been given the options to perhaps even going as far as to reassess the role of the grand visor I don't like my Grand Visor, to be fair. I won't give the opportunity to change around the seats in the Royal Council for another few years. Remind me again then. Yes, Your Majesty, I will. In the meantime, I will remain optimistic. It's been a pleasure speaking to you on this grand occasion. I'm honored we could witness it together. Sal and I said our goodbyes before we parted ways. Stepping out of the room, Titus greeted me with a brief bow. I hope everything went as expected, sir. Oh yes, I feel spiritually rejuvenated. After ascending the observation tower and stepping outside of Titus, I was once again greeted by the celestial phenomenon above. Titus momentarily stopped in his tracks to gaze overhead. It was then I realized this was the first time seeing it. This is astounding. I've never seen anything like it before. It truly is a sight to behold. Nature unfounds its wonders, revealing the divine touch in the heavenly display, leaving even the most devoted observers captulated. I couldn't have said it better myself. After saving the spectacle for a final moment, Titus guided me to the motorcade, and I resumed my journey back to the palace. I'm glad to hear we shared a similar experience. The alignment has given me an optimistic outlook for the future, foreseeing its shaping through the alignment of faith, governance, and the celestial forces above. Titus and I continued to speak about destiny and the cosmic depths of fate as we made our way back to the palace. Okay, we do have that as an option now. Change state religion to nurity. Through this decree, the state formally recognizes nurity as its official religion, transitioning from its worstest roots, a branch of nurity itself. This change reflects the consideration of spiritual belief system and practice under a broader religious umbrella, fostering greater unity within religious diversity of the nation. So that is an option we can now do whenever we want. Mm -hmm. 
Anti-Planetary Society. Millions man bar march ends in cosmic failure. The first annual launch of an event meant to bring together millions of like-minded anti-planet activists fizzled out before leaving the atmosphere. Organized by a group of anti-planetary society against the backdrop of a line of six stars, the march was held outside the Anxiar Sanctuary Plavo as a protest against the commonly held belief in other planets in our universe. However, instead of the expected seven-figure turnout, they managed to gather just seven attendants. We had such high expectations, said Dixie Gubne, president of the Fringe organization. The misguided belief in the theory of planets is one of the greatest tragedies of our times. It's harming society and indoctrinating our children's minds with fake science. Given the march virtually non-existent attendance, it begs the questions. But is the missile turn out, in fact, a sign from the heavens? No, it's probably a sign that the people that signed up were doing it as a joke. Kind of like um, the Area 51... Uh, the the um the alien area 51 thing that um that facebook got that huge amount of signatures for and then no one showed up to it it's like that in fact i wouldn't be surprised if that's a direct reference to it a celestial spectacle unveiled alignment of the six stars captivates the reason strikes in a celestial event that captured the hearts and imagination of Reesians across the kingdom, the alignment of the six stars unfolded in a breathtaking display in the night sky. Those from all walks of life ventured outdoors to witness this rare occurrence, creating a collective sense of wonder and unity under the celestial canopy. The event, long awaited by astronomers and stargazers alike, graced the heavens like a mesmerizing alignment of six prominent stars. Spectacle spectators marveled at the celestial choreography, the cosmic dance that left onlookers in awe of grandeur of the universe. To mark this significant moment, various viewing events were organized throughout Rizia, providing the public with telescopes, guiding expl explanations, and a chance to share in communal experience. Families, friends, and even strangers gathered in open spaces, fostering a sense of togetherness beneath the vast expense of the night sky. King Ramus and Wiseman Sal Ignatius observed the event together at Portage on Observatory Tower reinforcing the cultural and symbolic importance of the celestial alignment. Their shared enthusiasm for the astronomical wonder resonated with the gathered crowds, emphasizing the connection between the kingdom's leadership with its people. As the alignment of the six stars concluded, leaving a lasting impression on those fortunate enough to witness it, Rizian carried the memory of this extraordinary event back into their daily lives. The celestial spectacle not only showcased the wonders of the cosmos, but also served as a reminder for the unity and shared experience that bind the people of Rizia together. Was that funding religious charities, choosing a religious charity, funding their team. Uh, in the Rizian Kingdom, faith plays a vital role in the lives of many citizens. The Crown can support religious charities. The choices include backing a Wersus, Gulkinus, or Desinarius charity, each of its own unique doctrine and influence within Rizian society. Alternatively, the government could opt to refrain from funding any religious organization, maintaining a stance of a more secular government. Um. Um, no, not that one. Order, I think it's in, yeah. Warricist and Desnurist communities are unhappy. Galcanists are neutral. So we're gonna sp we're gonna fund Warricist charity just to try to get our popularity up. King funds Warricist charity. Our beloved King Ramos has allocated a generous budget to various Warricist charities, enabling those loving organizations to spread compassion and care throughout our society as we approach our traditional values. His generosity truly knows no bounds. Yeah. Alright. But this is a good time to go ahead and end this episode. I hope you enjoyed. And if you did, like, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell button. And as always, peace.